Lord, thanks so much for this morning. What a what a great, great word we're going to hear today from the book of James. So, Lord, use uh, use Derek in a mighty way. Uh, Lord, help us to hear and respond and act on on uh, what what he's going to share. Because we, we don't want to be just a hearer. We want to be a doer of the word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bring it on. Good morning. Doing all right? It's been a couple of weeks since I got to teach last, so excited to be back and continue through uh, the James study. Um, a little bit about me that you may not know. Uh, when I went to University of Central Missouri, I got my degree in social studies education. So I did my student teaching at Nam Nasser High School, and I'm technically certified to teach six subjects in the public school. I'm certified to teach U.S. history, world history, geography, behavioral sciences, uh, U.S. government, and economics. Um, and really, you'd never want me to teach your economics class. Um, but somehow I'm certified to teach it. But when I was at Nam Noster, I taught U.S. history, uh, U.S. government, and psychology. Again, don't know how I taught psychology, but we made it through. So uh, my favorite, however, was American history. And I taught from the time period of 1900 to 1950. Okay, so a very interesting time in America's history and the world's history, right? What happened during those years really um, has set in motion a lot of what's happening even today. And so, I mean, 1900 to 1950 um, covers um, um, World War I, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, World War II, and the beginnings of the Cold War, right? So a very fascinating time and place. But my favorite topic in that region was World War I. Every war that begins does not start randomly, but due to specific chain reactions that bring us to ultimate outcomes, which is war. And World War I is no different. And there were pieces that were put into place that triggered this first all-out war. And so I'm going to do a quick history lesson. I promise it's going to tie in. But there are four main causes or catalysts that started World War I. And it's really easy because it's it spells out an acronym, which spells out MAIN. So the M stands for militarism. Okay, so what was happening in the world well before 1914 was, was countries began building up their armies. It's like the game of risk. I would, um, let's say Damien and I are playing together, and I put 10 on the border that borders us to. Then Damien then's like, hmm, I'll put 11. And then I'm like, huh, I'll throw five more. And then he, you know what I mean? And, and we're building up our armies. The A stands for alliances. These countries began aligning themselves with other countries. Essentially, everyone was teaming up, which some meant they were on the same team, but then other times they were on opposing teams. The I stands for imperialism. This is building colonies and extending their country's reach for resources and power. Right, It's like if there was an inland country with no water access, they would be desperately trying to either find land or take land that they'd be able to have a waterway. And then the N stands for nationalism. Well before 1914, countries or people began growing proud of their country and hating those who were not in their country. Right, they, they hated those who were opposed. And so these four things that were happening well before 1914 meant that war was brewing and all it was going to take was for the final straw to break for war to erupt. And I believe that the spark and final straw that caused everything to go into motion was the assassination of Archduke of France Ferdinand, right? And he was the, he was the heir to the throne of Austria, Hungary, and he was assassinated on June 28, 1914. And so because of the four main catalysts, once the assassination happened, countries were primed for war. And then once uh, one country declared war on one country, all the allies stepped in and they were declaring war on other countries. And before we know it, we had an all out war. Countries responded to other countries, which brought about action. So why do I spend time giving you that history lesson? Because history is important. But also, um, I believe that for action to take place, a response is required. For action to take place, a response is required. Today, we're going to look at this passage in James 
in chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. And this passage is going to implore you and I to action. But that action will only take place if we respond to the Word of God. We've been going through these different tests in James, and today's test is called the test of response to the Word. Right? It's going to ask us, say, like, hey, how are you doing at responding to what God says? And we get to ask ourselves that. We get to see if we are passing the test. Again, James is a practical book, right? It's not going to get into the theological weeds of, of different doctrine, right? But it's going to go towards application. It's going to go, hey, this is how we are to live our life. We've covered a couple different tests so far in this series. The first one was the test of um, perseverance and suffering, right? And that was in, in James 1, 2 through 6, where we looked at, see, do we consider it all joy when we experience trials, right? Do we embrace um endurance do do we embrace this sanctification process this maturing process of believers the next test which was in james 1 13 through 17 we talked about the test of blame and temptation right kind of we ask this question do we do we point the finger elsewhere for our sin and say hey god you're making me sinner satan you're making me sinner hey that person is making me sin or do we point the finger at ourselves and say you know what this is on me right i'm going to take ownership over my sin because i'm the one choosing to sin not other people. And today, the test is the test of response to the Word. The Word of God is not simply meant to be read and to enjoy. It is to provoke you and I to live our lives the way God intended, which means we have to respond to what the Word of God says with action. So I've got the verse on the top of your notes. If you want to follow along or in your Bible, we're going to be in James all day. But it says this, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So this idea of response to the word, response that it's defined as a reaction to something. Again, I shared the, the thing about World War I because World War I started because there was a series of events that caused countries to react, which caused others to react, which caused others to react. And before we knew it, we had an all-out war. This is your first filling on your notes. The Word of God requires a response from all who claim to have a relationship with Jesus. It requires a response. Right, if we want to be men of action, if we want to be men that are doers, we have to act when the word speaks. We are required to do that. And so what is the word? Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The first thing that I see when I see this verse, it says all scripture, not some scripture, not most scripture. It says all of it is inspired by God. Other translations say God breathed, right? Like this book is not written by man. I promise you, if man made this book, it would look a whole lot different, right? It'd be a lot easier to get in heaven. We'd have a little checklist and say, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And then I'm good because this is not a book made by man, but it's a book made by God. And it says in second Timothy that, this scripture is profitable for four things, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This book is going to teach us. It is going to instruct us on how to live our life. It's going to reproof us. Uh, it also means to rebuke, right? Like this book is going to cut you. This book is not worried about your, your feelings, right? This book is going to speak truth, and it's going to speak truth whether you want it to or not. I said earlier, which I'm not sure if I was supposed to, um, this book is going to kick you in the pants at times, right? Like this book is going to get after you, okay? This is what the book is going to do. It's going to correct us, right? It's going to say, hey, you're living your life like this. You actually need to live it like this. And then it's going to train us for righteousness. Righteousness meaning being right in the eyes of God, 
but we're training for a purpose. So you guys, I don't know if you know this. I, uh, I'm running the, the Kansas city half marathon on Saturday. Um, I don't know how many former offensive linemen are going to be doing it, but I'm going to try. Um, and you guys like, I've been training since June for this sucker. And you guys, I'll be really honest. I'm sick and tired of running. <laughs> like I'm so done <laughs> with running. I'm like, just trying to like, I'm going to have my last training run after this. And then I'm like, I'm going to rest two days and we're going to go do it. And then I'm not going to run for like three years. So, um, but nonetheless, I've been training for a purpose. And that is to not only run, I want to do good at this race. I want to pass some people, you know what I mean? Like I want to um, roll, but I'm doing it for a purpose. In the same way we read this Bible for a purpose, which is to train for righteousness. We cannot be taught by the word if we do not read the word. We can't be rebuked by the word if we do not read the word. We cannot be corrected by the word if we do not read the word. We cannot be trained by the word if we do not read the word. All of these things change us because when we read the word, we respond to the word. And our lives and actions are different because of it. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It describes the word of God as a sword, right? and that's what it is, is. It's a sword. It will cut you, right? The sword's used for defense and offense. And guess what? The Bible does both for us, right? It's going to cut away flesh. It's going to cut away things that we want a part of our life that is not right. When we read the word, it has to make us respond and react, and our lives should reflect that. So these next five verses will make us ask ourselves if we pass the test of response to the Word. The Word of God requires a response to, from those who claim to know Christ. So we're going to get after it. James 1, verse 21, we're going to go verse by verse and work our way through, and then we're going to be done. James 1, 21 says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So the first phrase that pops out of me when I I read this, it says, putting aside all filthiness and wickedness. Putting aside in the Greek means, uh, likely means having put off as one would with dirty clothes. So again, right now I'm training for this half marathon. And you guys, um, again, a former offensive lineman, it means when I run, I sweat a lot. Today it's 50 degrees. I promise you when I'm done with my run, I'm going to look like I just hopped out of the pool, right? Like, like I'm going to be sweaty. And so what I do when I get home is I take off my shirt and I put in a dirty clothes hamper. And my wife says, Derek, do not put in a dirty clothes hamper. You're making all the other clothes dirtier. Um, to me, I'm like, it's, like, it's all going to go to the same place, right? But um, she wants me to hang my clothes. And so that's what I do now. I hang my clothes. I lost that fight. So um, nonetheless, I hang my clothes, but I take take it off. It'd be weird if I walked around all day with this soaking wet, dirty shirt, right, and just kept that on, kept that filth on. No, when I'm done with my run, I put it off. I take it off. I no longer associate myself with that shirt. Colossians 3, 8 through 10 says, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Again, this idea that we are to put aside, we are to put off everything that is filthy and wicked in our lives. We are not to associate with that self anymore because we are a new self, right? We cannot be a new self but still live in our old ways. Right, the old ways are dead. They're gone. They're no longer there. Right, and we get to be that new self and be renewed every single day with the Spirit. And we are commanded to actively remove all wickedness and filthiness in our life. We don't stumble into removing filthiness and wickedness. We don't do it subconsciously and be like, "Wow, this is cool." Like I no longer have wickedness and filthiness in me. No, no, no. It is a conscious thing that we have to do to get rid of it. It is an active removing. Filthiness also in the Greek was sometimes used to describe earwax. And so it gives this idea that um, 
filthiness we do not put aside will impede the believer's spiritual hearing. Right? We cannot respond accurately to the Word of God if we cannot hear it. And then the verse in 21 says we are to humbly, it says in humility, receive the Word implanted. The only way we can hear the Word and respond to it is if we humbly receive the correction the Word of God brings. The Word implanted will save our souls if we humbly submit to it. And reading God's word will make us want to push back, right? It's going to make us at times want to justify our sin and be like, well, you know, we give this excuse or this excuse, but no, we are to, in humility, receive the word and say, hey, whatever you got for me, Lord, like, I just want it. On your notes, I have it said, we pass the test of response to the word when we have a posture of rejecting sin and humbly receiving the word. We have to have this posture of saying, hey, you know what? First and foremost, I've got to put off. I've got to put aside this filthiness and wickedness. And then I got to put my hands up and say, hey, Lord, what do you got for me today? How can I respond to what your word wants me to live? But we have to do that in humility. We have to get rid of the pride. We have to get rid of the sin. We have to get rid of the things that are impeding that growth and say, hey, Lord, I have a posture of just saying, hey, what do you got for me today? We have to have that posture. James 1.22 says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. This phrase, prove yourselves, usually when we think of this, uh, we think of it in negative connotations. Right, we, We've all tried to prove ourselves uh, to teachers, to coaches, to, to parents, to kids, to, to uh, social media, right? And, and we typically do that for prideful reasons, right? Like, hey, look at me. Look how great I am. But this verse isn't talking about prideful reasons to prove ourselves. It's simply talking about um, we prove ourselves not for us, but to show God in us, right? It's just an overflow of what the Lord is doing in our heart. And there are two categories of people discussed here in this verse, and we're introduced to doers and hearers. Doers, this person does not just say he loves the Lord, but actively lives it out. This person responds with action and life change when they read and study the Bible. On the other side of the coin, we have this, this, this person, the hearers. These people hear, but they don't really hear. Right? They're the ones that go to church on Sunday and hear a message, and they're like, Wow, pastor, great. Or they read a passage in their Bible and they're like, God, go off. This is so good. And then nothing in their life changes. Right? They're a great fan, but they don't hop on the field. Right? right? They're great at cheering it on, but they're bad at making their life reflect what they're cheering on. It says in this verse that hearers delude themselves. You know, it makes me think of a diluted drink. Have you ever had lemonade? You walk up to a lemonade stand, you know, a little 10 year old is uh, serving it. You're like, hey, I'd like to get, get lemonade. And, and you drink it and you're like, listen, little girl, if I would have asked for water, I would have just asked for that. Right? Like, like I wanted lemonade, right? I wanted the sugar. I wanted everything that's good to be in this drink, right? Typically, um, when you drink a diluted drink, it, it It takes away the flavor and you do not get the full effect of the drink that you wanted. And the exact same thing happens to us when we delude the word of God in the gospel. We lose its full effect. Delusion brings about confusion and false beliefs. Right? Hearers delude themselves. They miss the effect of what the gospel has for their lives. You know, it makes me think of the phrase, walk the walk, don't talk the talk. Hearers are really good about talking about Jesus and the Word, but their actions do not reflect that. However, doers not only hear, but then there is a responsive action to what they heard or read, and then their life changes. I think a very, very good passage that, that kind of summarizes this is Luke 6, 46-49. It says this, and this is Jesus talking. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I'm going to pause there for a second. Why do you you call me Lord and not do what I say? I think it could be said today, hey, why do you call yourself a Christian, but then do nothing like 
what Christians should do? Or, or you do nothing that the Bible says? Continuing on, it says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them. Again, we see this action. I will show you who whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Again, you guys, we see that these doers, right? Like they're not only men of action, but they're men with a foundation. And they're men with a foundation that is not shaken, right? It has been well built, right? They've dug deep. They put in the effort. It is hard to be men of action, to be men who are doers. Then we continue. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house is great. Y'all, there is a consequence to those who are hearers of the word and not doers. And we see here that that consequence is the ruin of that house is great. What is your foundation like? Is it rooted in the word of God or elsewhere? This is on your notes. We pass the test of response to the word when we are doers of the word and not only hearers. Every once in a while, I try and get creative on on my feelings, and I'm like, let's just say what it says in in the passage, right? Doers respond with action. Hearers know how to play the part, right? Hearers know how to put on the show. They know how to make people impressed with them, but they don't walk the walk. These next two verses we're going to look at evaluate this here even more. James 1, 23 through 24 says this, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. So this word looks in the Greek uh, means to consider attentively, to fix one's eyes or mind upon. Observe carefully and cautiously as opposed to taking a casual glance. So this man, when he looks at himself in the mirror, does not like casually look, but, but actually looks, like attentively looks. And he has great intention with his looking in the mirror. Right? The man looked at himself for a purpose, but it was a waste of time when he walks away because he forgets. So on your notes, the person looked with great intention to change, but great intentions with no action is worthless. Great intentions with no action is worthless. You know, it makes me think of, you know, when I go to a wedding, I put on the suit, put on the tie, put on all that. And typically I look at myself in the mirror first to be like, okay, how did, how did it get put together? Right? Like, what am I working with? And, and let's say I go in the mirror and I'm like, oh man, my hair is all messed up. My tie is all wonky. I'm going to need to fix that before I go on to out to the wedding. But then I leave the mirror and I forget to change. What good was it for me to do to see things that needed to be changed and to not change them, right? It's worthless. I had good intentions to fix my hair and to fix my wonky tie. But when I did not fix them, what was the point? In the same way, hearers have great intentions when they read the word of God, right? Again, they have great intentions when they go to church. They have great intentions when they come to TJW, when they come to Bible study, etc. But hearers don't change. There's no purpose in us reading our Bible and seeing things in our life that need to be changed, but then ignoring it and continuing on with our life like nothing happened. Then we see that this hearer immediately forgets. On your notes, we pass the test of response to the word when we act promptly when the word of God convicts us. We act promptly. I don't know about you, but if but if the word of God convicts me and shows me something that I need to change in my life and I don't do it immediately, I will forget every single time. So we are to act promptly when the word of God speaks. We're not to delay and be like, you know what? It's a Wednesday. Monday seems like a much better day to start things. So like, let's start at Monday. That's when we're going to really start rolling. And no, like when the word of God speaks, we act immediately. 
Unless professing Christians act promptly after they hear the word, they will forget the changes and improvements that the reflection showed them that they needed to make. When we read the word of God, there will be things that are laid on our heart that we can improve on and will require a response from us. And you guys, sometimes it's really, really big responses, right? Sometimes we're talking about like, like very big life change. Sometimes it's little tweaks. Nonetheless, do we respond with action or not? And God's word is faithful to show us areas to improve and we must act on it. Like God's faithful to be like, hey, I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to, I'm going to mature you. I'm going to bring you about on this spiritual journey. This action takes place when we respond to God's word. Final verse, then we're almost done. You're going to get out early, fellas. This is awesome. James 1.25 says this, but one who looks intensely at the perfect law, the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. I love Greek def- definitions. This, this Greek definition of looks intently. So, and metaphorically, it means to look carefully into, to inspect curiously of one who would become acquainted with something. This is not a casual glance, but a deep longing look in something to ensure that it will not be forgotten. Again, the doer looks intently. And he doesn't look intently at something random, but at the perfect law, the law of liberty. Because he does not want to forget what is there. Unlike the hero who forgets immediately. My wife and I's favorite show to watch is Survivor. We watch like religiously every every year. But um, one of our favorite challenges to watch is when they go through an obstacle course and they get to the end and they have something to memorize. And they have to memorize it, then they have to go back to the obstacle course and see if they got it, right? And and when the people go out, they don't want to do they have to do the obstacle course twice. So they study and they memorize those symbols, those numbers, those whatever to ensure that they do not forget and have to go and return. Because in the same way, how intently are we looking at our Word of God? How intently are we saying, "Hey, I do not want to forget what is in this dang book. I want to remember it." The next word I see is abide, right? If, if we look intently at the perfect law in the law of liberty, we are to abide in this word. Abide means in the Greek to remain beside, to continue always near, to be in close proximity. When we stay close to God's word and make it part of us, we become an effectual doer and not a forgetful hearer. We're going to be in close proximity to something. Is it going to be the Word of God or is it going to be something else? What are we going to do? Your last filling on your notes, you probably guessed it. We pass the test of the Word of God or pass the test of response to the Word when we abide in God's Word. When we abide, when we stay close, we do not let it get far from us. John 8, 31 through 32 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are blessed when we abide in God's word and become an effectual doer of that word. But there are blessings when we, when we, when we say, hey, I'm going to stay close to this. We are anchored in the truth, and that truth brings a freedom greater than anything else we could ever ask for. Are we abiding in God's word? So in conclusion, The word of God requires a response to all who claim to have a relationship with Jesus. It's not a suggestion. It's not a hope. No, if we claim to know Jesus, then we are required to respond. We pass the test of response to the word when we have a posture of rejecting sin and humbly receiving the word of God. Right? We have to have this posture, say, hey, I'm getting rid of all that filthiness, all that wickedness, all of those things that are impeding my spiritual hearing. And I'm saying, hey, Lord, I've got a posture. Of what do you got for me today? We pass the test of response to the word when we are doers of the word and not only hearers. When we're men of action, when we, when we don't only talk the talk, but we walk the walk. Right, We're, we're not fans in, in, in the audience where we're like, hey, great message, and then nothing changes. No, we are doers of the word. 
We pass the test in response to the word when we act promptly when the word of God convicts us. We don't delay. We don't say, hey, I'm going to work on that next week, or I'm going to work on that once, once, once my kid is born, or I'm going to work on that once my kids are gone. I'm going to work, right? No, we say, hey, when the word of God speaks, I'm going to act promptly. I'm going to get after it. And then finally, we pass the test of response to the word when we abide in God's word, when we stay close to it, or when we do not let it get far from us, or we keep that sword next to us at all times. So application for us today, be a doer of the word. Right? Be, be said, Walk the walk. Right? Don't just be a fan. And then respond to the word of God with action. And even for me, I get to evaluate my life and say, hey, like what, what areas have, have I been slacking? Because there, there has been. Because the word of God is convicting me of things that I need to respond to do better. So as a man, I have a choice. I can respond and be a doer. Or I can take the easy way out and be a hearer. It's hard to be a doer. Because am I going to say, hey, Lord, I hear you. Let's do this. Respond to the word of God with action. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're done. Lord, thanks for who you are. Thanks for these men who take the time um, every Wednesday to just gather and be together. Lord, I pray for us as, as, as we evaluate our hearts and, and ask if we are men who respond to your word. Lord, I confess for the times that I have not responded. Lord, that I have not have a, had a posture of humility. Lord, where I've gotten prideful and feel like I've got my life together. Lord, where you've laid things on my heart and I've delayed them or pushed them aside. Lord, I pray that I am a man of action. Lord, that I lead my family in a way that honors you because of what you've done in my heart through this word. Lord, we're grateful for you. You're better than we could ever deserve. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.